Thank you, everyone involved in that. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. We had two gospel readings. That's not the norm. The reason for having two gospel readings, one reason, is that the first of the two was the lectionary gospel for today. And the other is the answer to the question, is there a good gospel that explains the first one, that acts it out, that we could have a skit, and that we could make it something where we take what we understand and move it to what we do. I don't know if you've ever thought about the Good Samaritan parable and realized that it, like most scriptures, works on several different layers all at once. For example, first, it's a simple question and a direct answer. Listen again to the scripture. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Simple question. Direct answer. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. So today we're acknowledging the transaction of teachers and students, the Sunday school classes, the church school classes that we just saw in front of us that we have had in this building week by week through the year, as Claire said. Deeply dedicated teachers, committed children. There's plenty of material in the parable of the Good Samaritan just the way I read it a moment ago. The question about eternal life is very important. It's part of why we're here. The story seems almost complete when the man gives the right answer. And Jesus affirms the questioner. You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Jesus, in his response, acknowledges what we all know, that the important thing is to link what we believe and what we do. He knows the right answer. Will he do the right thing? How do we apply our understanding in order to live according to our principles? Well, so just that much of the story is, is rich stuff of learning and teaching, applying what we learn to who we are. But that's just the starting point. That doesn't go all the way that our gospel reading of the Good Samaritan did. A deeper story emerges when Luke reveals the motivation. Think back to the way the kids acted it out. Luke reveals the motivation of the one who was asking Jesus the question. Now, a whole lot has been made of the fact that the guy was a lawyer, and if you need to have some fun with that, make up your own lawyer jokes and insert them here because he was a lawyer, and yet, the motivation of this lawyer in the story points to the inner nature of all of us. The lawyer is a caricature, but he's not a caricature of lawyers. He's a caricature of people. His motivation in asking Jesus what he does brings this story completely into our world. As Luke tells the story, it's not simply the question he asks. But the next level is how he asks the question. So we'll go back to the start of the parable, and this time pay attention to all the words. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why was this man testing Jesus? Was it his own personal interest? Maybe he'd heard that Jesus was a great guy, and he wanted to find out for himself, and this is just his way. Elsewhere in the Bible, especially during Holy Week, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others would ask Jesus questions to trip him up. I know if he answers this way, I've got him because it's wrong. We'll get Jesus. Did you notice the very first two words, the literary device, just then? It imparts an urgency. 
What's that urgency about? Do you remember the story of Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was afraid his friends would find out that he was talking with Jesus, so he met with Jesus at night. It was secret. Is this lawyer similarly asking Jesus a question when he's looked around and nobody else is watching? Just then he asked his question. Does it point to the way that we often, in our relationship with God, just leave God for those places where we're in a hurry, we're impatient. Have you ever dealt with a spiritual director? The first thing they do is to say, we're going to slow down. We're going to pay attention to our breathing. We're going to let the silence take hold. We're going to drink in the Holy Spirit. But this man's question came just then. And what does it mean just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus? Does it emphasize that this is in a period of testing of Jesus? It turns out no. If we read the stories in the Bible right before this story, we find that Jesus has sent 70 people out. He sent them in groups of two. And they've done a great job. Everywhere they went, good things happened. And they've come back and they're celebrating. In fact, right before the parable, it says, then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And then... Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Perhaps our reaction is that Jesus never seems to catch a break. This test comes when Jesus is relaxed. He's overjoyed that the disciples finally are getting it. This whole sequence appears in Luke right after the mountaintop of the transfiguration and Jesus has turned his face toward Jerusalem and toward the cross. The question is asked, Jesus answers. We tried already to simplify the, the transaction of the good question and the good answer, the challenge of living a life inspired by the knowledge. But then we notice the transition and the motivation. Rather than simply chalking up another good answer to Jesus, the lawyer follows up, and Luke makes sure we know why. The lawyer says, but I'm sorry, it says about the lawyer wanting to justify himself. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Well, that question only makes sense. To ask, who is my neighbor, when Jesus said that he had answered correctly, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, well, who is my neighbor? In the ethics of that day, there were probably answers. Your neighbor might be a certain distance around you geographically, the people who lived within a half mile, let's say. Or maybe it was relatives and friends and certain other people. In other words, there might reasonably be an answer to the question, who's my neighbor? And I could actually love all of them. But what's the answer in our world? I was reading the other day about a U.S. Navy captain. In 1988, he was steaming across the Indian Ocean. And he was on his way to the Persian Gulf, where the conflict had emerged, and he was supposed to get there. His ship was meant to get there. He encountered a boat full of Vietnamese migrants who the boat had, had it, it lost its power, and it was just drifting in the Indian Ocean. So he stopped, he gave them food, he tended to them briefly, but he went on his way because he had to get where he was going. Later, he was court-martialed. He was found guilty. The law of the sea says, you do not leave those people. I don't care what your orders are, you take them to port. So who is my neighbor? What laws are involved? The phrase, wanting to justify himself, describes a motivation which may sound at first kind of troubling, but it's one that we can embrace. How would we answer the question, who is my neighbor? 
Surely my neighbor is someone else in the church. Later, Louisa will invite you to look at the prayer lists in the bulletin, the church members, the others we've been asked to pray for. Certainly those people, they are our neighbors. My neighbor might be the family next door. Maybe the people that live around me. But are there limits? If I found someone along the side of the road, the robbers had left, I had the ability to help. I would hope that I would stop, or at least I would use my cell phone and call the police. But if I had any concern for my own safety, does that change the question? Who is my neighbor? How far does my understanding reach? What if my neighbor is someone who lives in Nepal and the recent earthquakes devastated their lives? Is that my neighbor? Is my neighbor also the immigrant I encounter whose English isn't very good yet? Does my neighbor include some nutcase who will organize a contest to draw the Prophet Muhammad knowing that it's going to tick off a bunch of Muslim folks who won't be able to help themselves but respond? Is my neighbor someone whose life has been turned upside down by a tornado or a hurricane to the point that we just sent a mission team down to Arkansas with the Presbyterian disaster assistance. And Ray Maurer and the others on that trip just came back Friday. Is my neighbor the guy, the guy they're collecting money for at work who tragically lost everything and needs help? Is my neighbor the young woman who came into the church office here this past Friday asking for assistance? Do we feed the hungry in Walnut Hills or should we be able to find enough hungry people on this side of the river and my neighborhood stops at a certain point? Our conversations about mission and ministry can pretty quickly pick up everything that Luke intended with the words wanting to justify himself. The filters and the parameters that we put on the question, who is my neighbor? Well, they can be pretty clear. What prompts Jesus to tell this parable isn't that this guy, this lawyer, is somehow bad or wrong or any different from you and me. But what do we tell the children? The first conversation we focused on was a direct question, a straight answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Answer, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. For years, our Sunday school curriculum has been primarily about that first level of this gospel reading, this conversation between Jesus and the lawyer. When I was a child, there were rewards for memorizing passages like this. There was affirmation for finding those places in the Old Testament that Jesus was quoting from. And when we had gone that far, we felt that we had shared our faith. When do we come to grips with the phrase wanting to justify himself? Why did Luke feel the need to add that detail rather than simply telling us the easy part of the story? And when are we going to get to the part where the priest and the Levite are the bad guys? I mean, some ministers with their holier-than-thou attitude can simply drive you nuts. Thanks goodness that that's the point, right? (laughs) And when no one is watching, they won't even stop to help this guy. And the guy's a Samaritan. I bet the people who heard Jesus tell this parable were all offended. Their prejudices were exposed. He really got them. Is that the message? Jesus actually affirms the question and perhaps the motivation by the parable that he offers. Who is my neighbor? And in this wonderful parable is the whole of Christian faith. There is no limit to who is my neighbor. Every child of God is my neighbor. The question Jesus points out is actually this. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So the lawyer 
again, answers correctly. In that, we find the third and perhaps the most important part of this parable. The first part is the simple question and answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Answer, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Second level, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus and the clarification wanting to justify himself. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? But the third part of the conversation is noticing that Jesus actually steers him toward the right understanding. Jesus reframes the question to provide the answer. The final question in almost all Bible stories might be this question. What difference does Jesus make in this story? And that, of course, is the real question of our lives of faith. We think this might be a story about a man, a lawyer, approaching Jesus. We can see his need for grace, his issues which might prevent him from truly being a disciple. Then we think it's a story about helping others, about the motivations we have to stop and help, to share our resources, to truly be a neighbor to those in need. But finally, it's a story about Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He takes seriously the inquiry about eternal life and the question, who is my neighbor? He offers a parable filled with grace, not only for the victim in the story, but for the lawyer hearing the answer. Jesus doesn't exclude or reject the man who asks the question. Jesus invites him into the joy that he's just celebrated with his disciples. Jesus doesn't judge the man or his motivations. Jesus affirms the understanding present and finds the right way to deepen the faith and understanding. What happens to this man? This man who asks these questions and shows up so prominently in this parable? The answer, of course, is we don't know. We can only imagine. But it invites us to ask a better question ourselves. What's going to happen to you, to me? How does the presence of Jesus Christ in my life, in my church, in our faith, in our understanding, help us to deepen our understanding and get all the way to living the life of faith that is possible for us? And that's what makes this the best possible story for Mother's Day and for a day when we celebrate our teachers and our children, the presence of Jesus Christ in our families, in our church school classrooms, in our worship. It makes all the difference, just as it did in this Bible story. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray that your presence in our lives will indeed make all the difference. That telling each other the stories of your love discovering together the power of your grace and mercy and peace will transform not only us, but the world that you send us out into. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.